So, uh, welcome to uh, this session on uh, small uh, holder and irrigation technologies uh, for for small holders. And we have uh, three, four panelists this afternoon. Um, and this session format will be such where I'm going to introduce all four panelists and then uh, three of the panelists uh, will, will give uh, a presentation. And uh, the three uh, presentations are uh, in reverse order as you see them in the book. In the book, they're, they're in alphabetical order, but we are going to follow the reverse order. First uh, with Stu Taylor, who uh, um, works at uh, IDE. He has over 15 uh, years of experience implementing and monitoring evaluation, economic development, food security, and nutrition programs. He joined IDE in 2006. Um, he's vice president for global initiatives. Uh, he heads the IDE technical team, including agricultural wash measurement and design. And he's responsible for strategies to engage local service providers as well as national and multinational firms serving bottom of the pyramid markets. I guess we'll have to have him explain what that means, right? <laughs> Uh, he holds a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Ottawa, Canada. I think you, and he lives in Canada, right? Yeah. That's right. So that's, that would be our uh, first speaker, uh, followed by uh, Dr. Gary Merkley, uh, who's an irrigation and hydraulic engineer, and uh, who I know very well, as we were both professors of irrigation engineering at Utah State University. Uh, until recently when uh, we uh, left to pursue other um, opportunities. Um, Gary has a PhD in irrigation engineering uh, from Utah State, an MS as well, and his BS is in ag engineering from Cal Polytechnic uh, State in California. Uh, I've known Gary for many years. He's an uh, irrigation engineer extraordinaire. He's an excellent programmer and is fantastic and fluent in many languages, uh, including uh, Thai, Spanish, Romanian, which he's learned recently in uh, Moldova. He speaks Mandarin Chinese, uh, dabbles in Arabic and Vietnamese. I mean, it's uh, quite something. So he's the type of guy you want on, on your international uh, team. Um, in addition to his uh, technical uh, expertise in irrigation engineering. And finally, uh, the third uh, panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Jose Luis Arumi, who's the Dean of Agricultural Engineering uh, faculty uh, at the University of Concepcion in Chile. Uh, he's a full professor there and teaches courses in uh, hydrology, groundwater, Water Resources Engineering. He has his PhD from University of Nebraska Lincoln. So he's come back home for uh, this, uh, this panel and works uh, with water augmentation and scarcity. And we'll be uh, talking about uh, the aspects of uh, uh, watershed management where in multiple uses of water involved, and in particular Chile is a snow-driven system like the Colorado uh, system, and so they're going to be grappling with uh, climate change and uh, decreasing snowpacks as we go along. But first, let me introduce Tim Pruitt. Tim Pruitt is uh, CEO of IDE, a nonprofit organization selling affordable technically relevant products and services to the very poor since 1983. Tim has worked in Africa, Asia, Europe on agricultural productivity, technology adaptation, and economic growth. And he is leading IDE to reach another 20 uh, million more people in the base of the pyramid. Aha, there's the pyramid again. <laughs> With products such as irrigation pumps, drip irrigation for smallholders, water filters and kits, Etc. Latrines and uh, 
Tim holds an MA in sociology and economics and an MBA with a Fulbright Scholar to Romania. Very good. So, Tim, please welcome uh, Tim Pruitt, who will give the opening remarks. Thank you. I, I think I'm set. Um, thank you very much. It, it's, it's really, what a, what a terrific conference this is. Um, I live in Colorado now, and so just to hear the story of the Colorado River, as we just did, was a real, was a real treat. So it's an honor to be here with you and, and speak at this great conference. We've also heard a lot of great comments on smallholder irrigation, starting with the session yesterday. And I, as, I, as I've listened to these wonderful presenters and, and kind of rewinded sort of where we are now with water, water for food, irrigation to grow more food, irrigation to help lift people out of poverty, these kind of critical issues, I began reflecting on, on our changing world, on the 16 uh, sustainable development goals and kind of where we are now. And if you look back in history, you can go back and look at at farming and water for farming. And if you say, take the 1920s, my, my grandparents were farming in Kentucky, in the mountains of Kentucky. So they had to capture water. They had a very simple farm, very low technology, a lot of barter and trade. That wasn't that long ago, really. I mean, yeah, okay, it's getting, getting to 100 years, but you know, we're a pretty young country. And we look across the pond at Africa and other uh, and, and countries in Asia, and you think they've been at this a long time. And, and, and for us, you know, as we enter the 1950s and we started to see plant protection, we started to see new improved irrigation, Valmont, I mean, Lindsay, these wonderful corporations here uh, in, in Nebraska, and, and step by step yield increased to now we're producing upwards to 10, ton, 10 tons per hectare on our, on our grains and you, you can get about one fifth of that on the typical African farm. And so looking at productivity issues throughout history, you can see the changes. And for us at IDE, we, we, our first social enterprise was in 1983. And back then, it was, it was a pretty simple equation. You know, you look at a, a country that, that's, that's poor and, the, and people that are struggling. And you say, well, OK, 90% of the people in that economy are working in agriculture. So your technology, your innovation is going to go into agriculture. It was like solve for x. And as you heard from some of the, some of the other uh, uh, presenters, if, if you manage your water effectively, that's, a, that's the first surefire way to get an increase in productivity in, in, in what you're doing. And ultimately, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, an increase in income. So it was a very simple equation. Now look at what we have, have today. Well, you know, let's go back and remember the, the yield gap from, from Ken Kassman from yesterday. This was a wonderful presentation. You saw, you saw these bread baskets around the world, you know, not only North America, but also China and South America and wheat in Europe. You see productivity has come up globally. Let's not forget we've made a lot of progress. It's not, you know, even in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's many pockets of, of increasing productivity. You know, Melissa Ho's slide on economic water scarcity, th this was very interesting as well thinking about the infrastructure uh, that's, that, that's required. And it's not sub-Saharan Africa is, is the weak one and everybody else is doing great. No, there, there's, there's variations all over the world. You have some countries that have, have variations in yield in different pockets of the country. There's a lot to correct on smallholder farms. Some people even question whether you can ultimately get the yield gains we need on a smallholder farm uh, given its size. You know, there's some restrictions in that. But we also know, we've seen it, the, the, the yields come up. I worked on Nigerian rice for a long time and we were getting six tons per hectare off those, those fields. Fixing the water side, the water side of the equation will, will deliver results easily. Uh, and in some ways, in, at some times, that'll be the first half of your yield increases. We researched it, especially with drip irrigation, and we saw that uh, of the improvements you can make on a farm, Irrigation will do the most, more than seed, more than fertilizer. Not in every case. It's hard to generalize with different crops and different systems. We also know that if you want to get up there and you, you want to make that land really productive, you need the full package, water, seed, fertilizer, and especially, and this is something we've come to really appreciate in our 30 years, is you really need to fix the markets so you, so you have a take on offtake. Um, Subsidies drive a lot of this. 
and I think we, we go into a lot of economies thinking technology is going to change it, and, and if that underlying subsidy uh, is lifting all boats here, it's tough to imagine sometimes uh, wh what's going on in a different economy. So um, again, you know, our, our founder, Paul Pollock, he used to ask a question, why are people poor? That's a great question, because they don't have money. I mean, it's an obvious answer. Um, but now that question, that solve for X, has gotten a lot more, more complex. Um, and I want to read off a few things here. This was with the um, Global Opportunity Report that was referenced just a little bit earlier. So we have more volatile weather systems. It's a hotter, dustier, drier climate. But also the volatility can really impact yields on a year-by-year -year basis. And of course, those at the base of the pyramid are going to feel those most. Lack of fresh water, uh, sanitation challenges. Two billion people on the planet don't have sanita adequate sanitation. And that impacts our water systems for drinking. That threatens the th fresh water supply and also threatens the supply of water for agriculture. Unsustainable urbanization. Our, our farms simply are stressed more by having to move the food around to the urban areas uh, and needing to, to, to produce more non-communicable diseases and a lock into fossil fuel. So this solve for X, you know, solving the poverty equation has just gotten so much more, more complex. Uh, and it's something that, that I'm pleased that, that IDE's team is, has risen to that challenge. We're working on more complex resource solutions. We're working on solar pumping. We're selling products now. And, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult at the end of the day to get things through to the last mile. It, it's sometimes hard for us to imagine. You, you see, you can get a Coca-Cola or a, a mobile phone scratch card almost anywhere in, in Africa. But can you look at three different competing smallholder irrigation systems? Absolutely not. Can you buy seed that you're guaranteed the quality of that seed is going to perform for you? Absolutely not. So that, that, that kind of quality trust challenge all the way through to the last mile uh, is something we, we have, have worked with and struggled with over the year, and it's a delivery challenge. I think Stu is going to be talking a little bit about, about this with with you today. So, you know, I'll, I'll summarize and turn this over because the smarter people are, are following me here. We, you have three wonderful uh, presentations and, and we're going to hear about Water Users Group. We're going to hear about some great activity in Chile. We're going to hear a little more about IDE's technologies and, and systems. Um, but I'm just, I'm honored to be here. I'm very excited to be part of this panel and this room should be full, but that's my opinion because I love the topic so much, but never mind that. Uh, we should have been giving out mobile phone credit or something that maybe would have, people would have showed up better. Never mind. Uh, it's great to open up this panel. Um, th thank you very much. And uh, uh, with that, let me, let me turn it over to, to the other speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, just a caveat before I start, the smarter people are still yet to come. So we'll gradually kind of get there. Um, thanks very much, and uh, I'm really pleased to have this, the best spot of the day, because everybody's had all this time to kind of get their brains ramped up, and everybody, this is the point where everybody is most attentive and most engaged, so I appreciate you spending this golden hour uh, in, this, in this session. Um, it's, it's interesting to sort of come at this point in the conference when we've had a chance already to engage with people and to listen and you always start to see some resonance of what you're going to talk about already and some of the things that have been spoken of uh, before. Of course, the session yesterday on, uh, on small-scale irrigation, very obvious resonance there in terms of the potential and, and uh, ways forward. Uh, Jeff Rake's comments this morning about catalytic philanthropy, very, very germane uh, to what I'm going to be speaking about, sort of where are those catalytic investments uh, for small-scale irrigation. Um, certainly, uh, Melissa's uh, slides that, that Tim was already uh, referring to, uh, and of course, the industry panel that we've just had, very, very relevant to what we're going to talk about. So what I want to do in this uh, brief uh, kind of setup talk, I guess, because we're going to have the panel discussion later, 
um, is first just briefly, very briefly, touch on the potential for smallholder solutions. And I don't think I need to dwell here, given that there has already been a fair bit of talk about the potential. Um, and I want to spend a bit more time looking at some of the trends, the challenges, and the opportunities, uh, certainly from the perspective of uh, IDEs on the ground perspective. Um, so what I'll be doing is speaking a bit more from some experiences and examples uh, to kind of illustrate some of those trends and some of those opportunities. Um, and then finally, to just briefly identify uh, some key opportunities for public and private investment uh, in what we, we call water smart solutions for, for smallholders. Um, and I'm in illustrious company here, I guess, <laughs> not, not being able to... Is it? Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't press it that time. I did it with my mind. Okay. Um, so IDE, uh, as as many of you may know, does have a long history with small scale irrigation solutions, going back to the the early 80s, as Tim alluded to, with the very successful marketing of treadle pumps in Bangladesh in the Gangetic Basin, uh, resulting in uh, ultimately the sale of around two and a half million pumps, uh, over one and a half in in, in Bangladesh alone. Um, and, you know, that, that was a very kind of successful defining moment for IDE in terms of the marketing of small-scale uh, irrigation um, and wa water smart solutions. And it was quite revolutionary. It was the right thing at the right time. Um, but, you know, you could say, well, by and large, I think, you know, the world's kind of moved on. Uh, we don't major sort of on, on treadle pumps at this point. There's other, other technologies, other solutions. Um, but I think a lot of the lessons that were learned through that experience remain very relevant today. Um, and I think two key things are the fact that this uh, enterprise was rooted in, first of all, listening to users, uh, and second of all, catalyzing the market and understanding how to do that. Um, so, and that's, that, that's what I want to come back to a little bit. So the, the potential, there's, there's obviously very high potential uh, and also need to bring water smart technologies to smallholders. Uh, those who are currently using inefficient, very laborious techniques uh, to irrigate, if they irrigate at all. Uh, many studies, including our own, uh, have demonstrated very significant gains in farmer productivity and income uh, from the application of small-scale irrigation technologies. Um, and I, I like to almost see it as bringing farmers sort of into more modern, let's say, precision agriculture, not in the sense of when you have half an acre, you don't necessarily need to map it out on a GPS system with your uh, soils and whatnot. Um, but moving up to a next level of, uh, of, of farming that, that opens up new possibilities for productivity and for income. But of course, there's also a growing environmental and, uh, and, and resource management need for water smart technologies, um, given that smallholders are on the front lines of climate change. It's kind of cool, actually. I can see the laser bouncing off the... Ah, wow, you press the right button and it actually happens. <laughs> As I said, the smarter people are yet to come. Um, so there's, there, there, there's this growing environmental and resource management imperative, as well as the uh, income, prosperity, productivity imperative. Uh, and we've already heard a lot of these statistics. Um, the tremendous potential for the expansion of uh, small-scale pumping in Africa, the work that was done by IFPRI earlier to, to model uh, the potential for uh, small-scale pumping. Uh, the fact that only 5-6% of Africa currently is under irrigation, uh, the, the, the cultivable land in, in, in Africa. Um, but I think what we need to understand is that the opportunity is not just about the adoption of a new piece of equipment, but rather, as I was saying, this, this transformation toward a new way of doing agriculture, uh, this precision agriculture for smallholders, really emphasizing a, a more commercial orientation and optimizing on the resources, uh, the inputs, labor, and of course water. Um, this is a photo I just took uh, recently in, in Cambodia where you can see examples of fairly sophisticated uh, production going on, on on very small plots uh, with mulches being used, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, nice trellising and um, quite, quite good, it, albeit low cost systems for distributing water through, through drip irrigation systems and also the application of fertigation, um, which in and of itself, it's not just about the water, but what the water then also uh, facilitates and allows and the tremendous gains in, in, in production that we can see from that. Um, so how do we approach the challenge as, as IDE? Um, 
as I said, the success in Bangladesh was really rooted in deep user understanding and being able to catalyze the market. And so we start with that deep understanding of users and the a solid analysis of, of the market, including where are the bottlenecks, where are the opportunities. And we tend to view things through these three lenses of desirability, feasibility, and viability. So desirability, do people want it? Uh, is this something that farmers are interested in, that they're going to buy? Do we understand their experience? Uh, feasible, does it work? I mean, it doesn't matter if you've got a pump that everybody wants, if it doesn't actually pump water. Uh, and viable, does it make business sense? Uh, so can it be profitable? Is it affordable? Uh, can you scale this up? Um, and we also understand water smart solutions. And I think this is, a, this is the point that I'm going to keep hammering back on. Um, we have to understand all irrigation solutions, but especially smallholder solutions in the context of the broader production system that they're taking place in. There's no magic in a drip system or a pump increasing income. Uh, it happens through uh, the appropriate optimization of the resources available and through hitting the markets that offer the greatest potential for uh, uh, income for, for farmers. Uh, this is a very obviously simplistic diagram of what's going on. Um, but I think, you know, captures some of the key elements of the inputs needing to be available, the right inputs at the right time, um, the water access, appropriate water application, of course, the information, uh, both in terms of promotion, also in terms of management practices, and the access, and all of this being driven by access to high-value markets uh, to actually buy what's, what's being produced. And most often, this also requires some form of financing through the chain. Um, and usually, if there's a breakdown somewhere along the line, you're not going to see those, those tremendous results that we've, that we've talked about a lot. Uh, so I, I just want to share a couple of examples from IDE's experience that sort of uh, identify some of the uh, trends, uh, some of the opportunities and challenges. Uh, so we'll start with water access. I'm going to keep coming back to this just to kind of map out where we are uh, in terms of the picture. Um, and so water access is very critical. If you don't have water, you d can't do irrigation. Um, this is a, a photo from uh, Burkina Faso where we've been promoting uh, small-scale drip irrigation for a few years now. Um, Obviously, there are broader trends in terms of increasing water stresses in many areas, but of course, you've just got the seasonal um, issues as well, especially in Sahelian regions, uh, often then water sources partly through the season dropping down below suction depth. So a simple suction pump is not going to be able to suck the water up. That's what happened in this field. Um, they had their system set up. They were irrigating halfway through. They were no longer able to access the water. Of course, lost the crop. That's a tragedy. Um, and so we have to learn from these experiences and understand how do we understand very localized watersheds, very localized uh, water dynamics, so that we can be sure we're not running into these kinds of problems. Uh, and of course, also then innovating in terms of technologies with more deep set pumps and abilities to uh, access water that may not be quite as accessible. Uh, something else is the decreasing price of uh, photovoltaics. Um, we've kind of been on a, on a longer journey of innovating in the solar pumping space and seeing this as really a potentially revolutionary technology as well. Um, this is where we're at now. Uh, it's a pump called the Sunflower Pump. It's a very small scale. It's an 80 watt pump, um, piston pump, uh, doing very small uh, plots of land. Uh, but this is kind of where we were before. Um, this is kind of where we started when PV was a bit more expensive. So it was trying to figure out how do we harness more sort of thermal solar energy, turn it into steam, and run a steam pump. Uh, now, thanks to the declining cost of PV, we've kind of moved away from the steam, uh, and we have the, the sunflower pump, which right now, uh, excitingly, is just at a, at a point of moving from the technological uh, innovation. We've got about 60 out in the field right now, now moving into commercialization uh, with a company we've set up called Future Pump uh, that is manufacturing, distributing these, uh, these, these pumps. Just a very short anecdote on this. This is a solar concentrator uh, to take the solar energy and really concentrate it in to run the, uh, the solar steam. Uh, our irrigation engineer uh, does a lot of the innovation in his own backyard, and uh, one day he came home and his neighbor told him that he had just put out a fire on his fence. Uh, he'd had a tarp over top of the solar concentrator, <laughs> and the solar concentrator did a very good job of concentrating that solar energy on his wooden fence, and uh, his neighbor luckily was just coming out of the house and noticed smoke pouring from his fence and came over and fixed the problem. Um, so these, these are all, these are all uh, areas related to, to water access. Um, also, uh, looking at it from a slightly different angle, uh, innovative and creative ways of looking at multiple use uh, water systems. This is from Nepal, uh, where IDE has been a, a pioneer in, in developing uh, multiple use water systems. Um, and 
really also raises that issue that we talked about yesterday, that um, it's rare that we're talking about irrigation in isolation from water and sanitation or vice versa. Uh, if people have access to an irrigation pump and nothing else, they're going to be drinking from the irrigation system. Uh, if they have access to drinking water and nothing else and they're needing to grow, they're going to be drawing down resources from uh, drinking water to do irrigation. So these multiple use water systems offer a more intentional way of managing uh, those dual needs, uh, dual demands on, on water and providing access. Um, and just, just a note too, actually, on the, on the solar pump in terms of catalytic investments. Uh, that was something that was initially started in those solar steam uh, innovations uh, through the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, more recently with Powering Agriculture uh, partnership from USAID, we've now been able to bring it to this point of moving into commercialization. Uh, and so now we start to look at different types of investments to, to take it to scale. Um, water application, of course, also uh, absolutely essential. And we've been focusing a lot of energy in this area. Uh, a trend here is really the commoditization of drip. Uh, we're starting to see, you know, drip systems now becoming much more commoditized. Uh, margins are very, very thin on it. And we're finding more and more systems that are kind of in the range that, that users are able to afford. And we're finding quite a range now of solutions that actually technologically work for different smallholder applications. And we're able to then apply in different scenarios. We really started out at a time when... Uh, you know, the drip systems were a bit more expensive and out of reach. Um, sort of innovating uh, system of, of microtube drip uh, with these uh, plastic, well, I don't know why I'm pointing here, you can't see there, but uh, these plastic uh, microtubes here into a, into a lateral, uh, allowing them to access the water uh, out of the system. I would say now we're kind of starting to move away from the microtube drip. It's a very entry-level system, uh, and farmers now, when they have the choice and they've been exposed to the technology, they can spend a little bit more money uh, and get a more commercial product uh, that doesn't use drip, uh, the microtubes, uh, using drip lines and whatnot. They're tending to opt for those solutions, which also tells us that farmers are not necessarily going for the absolute uh, you know, bargain basement solution. They're looking for value for money. And as long as the system is... Uh, structured in the right way, they're able to make those investments and get more value out of the system. Information. Uh, I think when we've spoken with drip companies and we speak with, it was great to hear from, uh, from Jane just now, when we speak with other companies like uh, Netafim and Toro, we keep hearing the same thing. Information, absolutely critical. You can't just lob a, a drip system over the wall and expect a smallholder farmer to pick it up and uh, apply it to their field and voila, you've got massive increases in productivity and income. It's, it's, a, it's a radical shift in the way that we do agriculture. And you know, I made reference to fertigation and other approaches. The whole management approach has to change. Plus, there's also, from the get-go, dealing with the promotional and perceptional, uh, perception issues. Uh, we've had experience in Burkina Faso doing promotion of, of drip irrigation. Farmers get excited about it. They get a system. And then you go back to check, and you see all the microtubes have been pulled out. Why? Because they walked down on the first day, and they didn't see enough water coming out. And they thought, oh, I'll, I'll pull out the tubes. Now I can see the water flying out of the system. That's better. Um, and so it takes time, you know, demonstrating the possible uh, to really convince farmers, OK, this works. Uh, when I was just in Cambodia, I was on a field where they were just installing uh, about 4,000 square meters, uh, about, about an acre of, of, uh, of drip irrigation. This was somebody who had, she, she had refused a free system uh, through a USAID uh, program. Uh, but that was about a year and a half ago. And her neighbor had gotten one and gotten some good uh, then follow-up support uh, from uh, the ID staff and ID program and was doing very well into a third or fourth uh, season of production. And she had then decided, having given up having a, a free system, to invest her own money uh, to, to install the system, now having seen that it works. So demonstrating the possible, uh, uh, certainly critical there. Uh, one of the key techniques that we have found to be very successful is the use of localized private uh, sales agents who are able to provide access to inputs as well as advice at the same time. In, in a lot of scenarios, smallholders are buying their inputs often from a, 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 a shop that may sell toothpaste, it may sell soap, and so there's no guarantee that the person who's selling you the seed has any knowledge of you know, the best way to optimize on it. Uh, even worse, of course, if you're buying pesticide. Uh, and you're Khmer from Cambodia, you're buying pesticide where the instructions are in Thai or in Vietnamese, uh, and the person who's selling it to you knows more about toothpaste. Um, I mean, you probably know enough not to use it for toothpaste, but there's uh, you know, a real need for this technical assistance and support along the line. 
Uh, and these farm business advisors uh, we've found now to be uh, very, very successful. Um, in Cambodia, more than uh, 200 now active, uh, serving around 14,000 clients. Uh, in Zambia, we're now hitting similar numbers with, with those uh, independent agents. Um, and the, the promotion, you know, I think there's often catalytic investments up front in developing a brand around which you can do promotion, not necessarily just to promote the brand itself, but to promote the whole concept of a new way of, of, of doing things. Um, and this is just to illustrate that often the information and the inputs we found are, are bound together. You could also put into that the, some of the technologies. All of these be, can be put through this system uh, so that you've got these things being put together in a way that makes sense and that farmers have the, uh, the technical know-how at their, at their fingertips. And then there's the output side. Uh, and of course, this is absolutely critical. Without a market, there's not much point. Um, you know, not much point in making all those investments coming through to the end than having a big pile of rotting tomatoes or rotting onions. It's just a mess. Um, and uh, so here, you know, we, we need to be paying attention to where are those high value opportunities for smallholders. Again, it's not just about irrigation. What are you irrigating? Where are you going to sell that? What are the channels? Um, and we tend to engage both in what I call top down and bottom up approaches. Top down, engaging with the buyers and helping to structure ways in which they can access uh, produce from, from smallholders and bring them closer to smallholders. At the same time, bottom-up approaches that bring the smallholder closer to the buyer, uh, ways of collection centers, for example, where uh, producers can aggregate their produce. It doesn't make much sense for most commercial buyers to be going down the road buying a bushel here and a bushel there. But if you can aggregate it up to the point where it makes sense for a trader to send a five-ton truck down the road, then you may be in business. Um, one of the other things we're quite excited about with the output market side as well is the increased uh, potential also for financing. Um, it can be difficult financing on the input side uh, where it may be disconnected from uh, the market opportunity and of course the, the risk as well. And there are ways of managing then the risk on the output side uh, with contract farming, outgrower schemes, etc. that may provide additional vehicles for um, really facilitating farmers' investments uh, in uh, in, in irrigation and uh, the plus around that, we like to say. Um, and this is, this is one example of a, a collection center in Nepal. We call them now commercial pockets, uh, where they aggregate farmers both on the output side, but also then for uh, accessing improved inputs and whatnot. Um, one other thing I want to note here as well is that these kinds of mechanisms, these bottom-up mechanisms, and I think we'll be hearing more about this as well in subsequent presentations, but organizing farmers in this way also offers tremendous potential for the empowerment of women. Um, this photo is taken from a recent, uh, recent photo taken from Nepal, uh, a project we were involved in organizing um, these uh, collection centers with women, uh, which engaged about 10,000 women in uh, commercial collection centers. Um, there's an initial uh, subsidized investment to do the organizing, governance, training, uh, but now they're commercially driven, uh, and 95% uh, of those uh, members of those collection centers are women. Uh, so it provides a tremendous uh, kind of set of, of outcomes on the social side as well. So I've spoken a bit to the, to the finance piece. I think we've, we've found, um, we've been able to work with finance partners to structure finance products that seem to work very well. The brick wall that we're running into quite often is some of the institutional operational limitations um, faced by these financial institutions, that they're just not able to scale to the point uh, where we need to be able to scale to. Um, just some of their own internal operational uh, constraints that are really uh, standing in the way of, of scaling up finance that really works and is structured for, for smallholders. And finally, just to look at where are those opportunities for investment. I'm drawing here from uh, Beyond the Pioneer report that some of you may be uh, familiar with, uh, but uh, we've um, found a lot of value in the, the Blueprint to Scale and Beyond the Pioneer uh, reports that kind of give us these, these frameworks to think about things in. And looking at catalytic investments from the perspective of firm, value chain, public goods, and government, sort of moving from the individual more proprietary um, out to that enabling environment, and where can we make uh, those really catalytic investments. And I'll just touch on a couple and then I'll close. Um, you know, I, I think there's great opportunities here for investments in market intelligence to guide investment. Um, as I said before, 
demonstrating the possible, which essentially in many ways is buying down risk on upfront innovation, innovation both technologically like we saw with the uh, sunflower pump, as well as innovation in, in business models where we can demonstrate something works, it makes it easier then for private investment to come in after that. Um, as I already said, investing in farmer structures to boost access to market like the collection centers. Um, as well as working more broadly on countering negative perceptions, uh, helping to get the word out and, and change perceptions around some of these newer technologies and, and, and raising awareness about what is possible. Establishing standards for these technologies. Um, I think there's a role there for industry and potentially for public investment as well to come in and, and help to establish some, some minimum standards. Um, as well, looking at um, advocating for addressing uh, market distorting subsidies uh, and also in some cases um, import duties and other, other barriers to, to market that may exist. Um, and so I'll just leave it there saying I, you know, we, we see these great opportunities. We've seen a lot of this working in different parts of, of uh, programs that we're working with. We're, we're very excited at this point to take this to another level as well, um, actually working with some of the major uh, drip companies um, to push forward on something that we're talking about as, as drip plus, really taking this precision agriculture, water smart agriculture, um, centered around often drip irrigation, but really emphasizing that plus coming back to that, that diagram that I've, been, that I've been coming back to. And that's, I think, where the real catalytic investments lie uh, to boost private sector investment in this and really take uh, smallholder irrigation to scale. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Um, I guess I have my uh, slides coming up. Oh, yeah. OK, thanks. So I'm going to talk about some experience on uh, water users, uh, associations, or organizations, and irrigation management and transfer. So as we've been hearing, uh, the world population is increasing. <clears throat> and right now, I think we're at about 7.4 billion. And by, uh, someone said this morning that by the year 2050, we'll be up around 10 billion. And this is gonna be creating increasing pressures on agricultural systems to provide food. And not only that, but something that hasn't been mentioned very much here today, fisheries. Many of the world's fisheries are um, overexploited right now, and this is also a big source of food for people around the world. <clears throat> so we can ask a number of questions. Uh, what can we do to uh, feed the world? And one of the first questions you might ask is, uh, can agriculture keep pace with the population increases? And the answer, the short answer is uh, yes to a certain extent. And I don't know what extent that is, but for sure it cannot keep pace forever if the population keeps um, increasing. Um, and what kind of things can we do to increase the uh, productivity of agriculture? And that just means increasing production. And if I say productivity, uh, maybe that's increasing uh, production per unit of input, for example, per unit uh, volume of water that's applied through irrigation systems. And also to make it profitable and to make it sustainably profitable for farmers so that they can stay in business and keep producing. Um, there's also the issue of moving the uh, agricultural products from places where there is excess to places where there's a need for more food. And so it's not just a matter uh, of a uh, uh, looking overall globally at the food production, but also looking at how the food's going to get to where it needs to go or where we would like it to go. Um, and in general, how can we improve the use of the resources that are available to um, improve agricultural production and uh, food production in particular? And these resources are human resources, uh, water resources, uh, technological resources, and so on. So 
my background is in engineering. Uh, first, I was a farmer in California, and uh, then I became an engineer. And um, so I'll talk about some different approaches that we can use to help um, increase agricultural productivity and food production in the coming years and coming decades. Um, and in this, I think we can categorize them into technical or hardware uh, approaches and non-technical or, if you like, software approaches to um, improving production. Um, and some of the technical approaches are in increasing water supply. It could be um, water storage facility, uh, better or larger water storage facilities. It could be exploiting uh, groundwater uh, better. And in some cases, uh, people talked this morning about uh, groundwater that's uh, non-recharged um, and it's just groundwater staying there. And in some cases, I mean, you have to make a decision. You're going to leave the water there or you're going to use it. And for example, in some places in Northern Africa, they found uh, geological water and they said they could leave it there or they could pump it out for 50 years and, and use it for irrigation. And after that, they know it'll be depleted and uh, there won't be any more recharge for the next uh, few thousand years probably. Um, you can also talk about desalinization of seawater, but that's very expensive right now. If you can come up with a, uh, inexpe an inexpensive way to desalinate seawater, you'll probably be a billionaire overnight because so many places are next, uh, there are so many coastal cities and also agricultural areas that are near um, oceans and saltwater seas. Uh, we can also work on water management. And again, from the technical perspective, we can improve irrigation and drainage. So a lot of times we say irrigation, we also mean drainage. Um, in many cases, um, drainage is more important than, than irrigation. Uh, some places have too much water most of the year and, um, and not enough water maybe in just certain times of the year. Uh, we also, a lot of people, and there are conferences about ET and crop water requirements, and a lot of focus on this, how much uh, water do the crops need, different types of crops, crop coefficients, and it continues to evolve. But on the other hand, we also need to think about flow measurement. How can we um, document how much water we're actually applying to fields and to crops? Um, otherwise, it doesn't really help us that much to say how much water the crops need if we don't know how much we're putting on. And many irrigation systems around the world, including many systems here in the United States, uh, they're lacking in flow measurement capability. Uh, you can also do automation of uh, uh, canal gates, of pumps, and other um, infrastructure and systems to uh, help um, improve water management. That's one way, that's one reason for doing it. Uh, SCADA systems, supervisory control and data acquisition, these kind of things can help us um, see how the system is performing better and, and to make improvements. And of course, there's agricultural development, uh, cultural practices, and uh, agronomic things like better seeds and better varieties, hybrids, and so on. And as I said, I'm an engineer and I always thought that the most interesting and most difficult problems were technical, but actually I came to the realization maybe 20 years ago that the most difficult problems by far are the institutional uh, social problems, things that, uh, that we talk about like behavior change um, and changing the way people think. And this is actually by far much more difficult than uh, the technical problems. And so a lot of times we need to give more emphasis and more time to these non-technical approaches and, and to have the patience to see them through. Uh, I mentioned the first bullet, land tenure evolution. And that's because I've seen in many countries, um, I haven't worked in Sub-Saharan Africa. I worked most of the other places. Um, although we do have a project starting next month in uh, Western Africa. And in many of the places that I've seen, they've had agrarian reform or partitioning of land and uh, decide to give a little piece of land to everyone. And for example, in the former Soviet Union, in some of these countries, they took the old state farms, kolhoz, and these things, divided them up into pieces. Uh, someone with a GIS uh, and looked at a map and 
and broken into pieces and said, here's yours, here's yours, and here's yours. And it seems like a good idea, but a lot of times it's not feasible, um, it's not practical. Uh, for example, the people who get this land, they may not even be farmers and have no experience with farming, but it's all they have. Maybe they have no pension uh, or very little, not enough to live on, so they have to go out there and see what they can do. But a lot of, these, a lot of times these places, these uh, fields are, are shaped in a certain way or they're, um, they're so small that people cannot survive. And so like someone else was saying this morning, uh, maybe uh, some of the men are going to the city, driving taxi uh, for Uber, I don't know, or um, in construction and so on, or going out of the country and doing that. And, and then someone, maybe they're making a living on the farm, but then uh, that person um, in, in his or her will leaves the land to their children, two or three children, then it's split up even further, and it's just not, it's just not workable to uh, farm that land. So sometimes when you have these really small land holdings, uh, the natural evolution is that you move towards consolidation of land and to something that's actually viable and that can, uh, can move along in the long term. Um, we can also look at administration, communications, operation and maintenance. Sometimes we can't make operational improvements until we make maintenance improvements because the system is not in good condition. And many irrigation systems are are not, have not been maintained well, and uh, this severely limits what we can do with operations. And now getting to the uh, focus of this uh, presentation on water users organizations or associations. Um, here we talk about organizational development of these associations, um, and in that, a part of that is institutional strengthening, and when I say institutions, I mean rules. So legislative uh, foundation um, in the country, maybe local laws and regulations, the bylaws of the Water Users Association and in internal regulations. All these kinds of laws and rules that guide about what, what you can do, what you can't do, and how you should go about doing things. So this is a big part of it, and to formalize these rules so that everybody knows what it is, and as I'll mention a little bit further on here, um, it gets into the idea of transparency, which is really uh, critical for these organizations to survive. So we develop these water users organizations and then we do a management transfer, an IMT or irrigation management transfer. And this puts uh, decisions about operation maintenance and administration of the irrigation system in the hands of the users and in the hands of the people who are more permanently there and who have the uh, vested interest in the functionality of this system for their own livelihoods and profitability of their farms. So more questions. Um, why should we uh, transfer irrigation system management to farmers organizations? or water users associations. And I'll, I'll, I'll propose some, um, some answers to that question in the next slide. We can also ask the question, who wants the transfer? And one of them is the funding agencies, which could be a donor agency, it could be a, a lender agency, uh, like MCC, uh, USAID, World Bank, and European Union, and, and others. Uh, maybe they want it um, because they think it will uh, decentralize decision making, it will improve operation and, and uh, maintenance because the people who will be in charge of that will be people who are on the farms and in those areas and they know best or they will know best about how it should be done rather than someone who's coming from a city maybe as I've seen in many cases. They don't really understand agriculture, they don't understand irrigation uh, requirements and they're not in tune with what the farmers need. Um, the governments may also support this. And a lot of times at the top level, the government does support the management transfer uh, because, uh, for, well, for various reasons. One of them may be because they can't afford the subsidies anymore for agriculture, and they become convinced that if they transfer the management to a water users association, that the uh, they will no longer have to, do, have to provide subsidies. And another reason may be, and sometimes it sounds a little cynical, uh, things that I might say, but 
uh, it's because the uh, donor agency or the funding agency ins has insisted as part of a package that uh, they need to do this irrigation management transfer. And so to go along with the whole thing, they say they accept and say, all right, that's fine. We're going we're to do that, even though they may not be fully convinced uh, that it would work or that that's what they want. Do the farmers want it? Usually the farmers do want it. However, at the same time, if they have no experience with this, which often they don't, then they have doubts and they're hesitant to accept responsibility for this because they're not sure if they can do it or not. And that's part of the job of a, um, a program that's implementing this irrigation management transfer is to convince the farmers that yes, you can do it and it has been done in other countries um, and done successfully in other countries. So uh, this is part of it, is to uh, convince them that to have the, um, um, the confidence that they can really do it. Do you think somebody doesn't want to transfer? Well, yeah, because uh, no one wants to dismantle their own kingdom. And so if you're a regional agency um, that uh, has traditionally been uh, operating and maintaining, or at least operating these systems, um, you're taking away their power, you're taking away their job, um, and they're not going to like it. So that's why part of the irrigation management transfer program, in many cases, is defining a new role and a new vision, a new mandate for the, these agencies to provide uh, normative um, services, uh, maybe extension services, and other things that they could do to transition into something uh, away from operation and maintenance and into uh, a different kind of role. Uh, we can see right here in the uh, United States, for example, the uh, US Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation went through a very uh, big transformation from uh, engineering, design, and construction to uh, more of a management oversight uh, type of agency. And it was difficult for them to do this. And it's, it's similarly difficult for uh, government agencies in other countries. So what are the objectives or what are the reasons that we want to do this transfer? Uh, one, as I said, is to comply with the donor's wishes or the lending agency's wishes. Um, another one, as I said, is to remove subsidies or at least to reduce them, uh, recognizing that generally speaking, the subsidies should not be a long-term permanent uh, fixture in the economy but it should be something to address um, emergency conditions or, or certain temporary situations where the farmers uh, need help. And, and this is something that even exists uh, here in the United States and Europe and, and other so-called developed countries, although I would say that all countries are developing. And, um, and you, you see subsidies at least from time to time in, in any country for agriculture and for irrigation systems. So it's, something, it's not something you get rid of completely. Um, we want to build the water users organizations because if you don't have an organization, then you're not going to be able to do management transfer, of course, because you have no one to transfer it to. We also want to build uh, sustainable, durable, and um, flexible and adaptable uh, water users associations. Because when we talk about sustainability, a lot of people say sustainability, sustainability, and they're concerned about that. After the project finishes, the investment is not, um, is not durable. It's not uh, continuing on. Um, and a lot of this is actually due to, a lot of this is, um, the, the sustainability is due to being flexible and being adaptable. Because we like to make improvements and feel like we're on a continuous path of improvement. But in a large sense, that means, and especially in the longer term, that means that you are uh, adapting to changing conditions. Maybe it's climate change. Maybe it's uh, different cropping patterns. Maybe it's uh, um, political decisions and different irrigation technologies or availability or non-availability of water and so on. So you see some um, irrigation districts or irrigation um, um, systems that have that have been around for hundreds of years. And the reason they've been around for hundreds of years is they've adapted and survived. And of course, they've seen, they face different kinds of problems, different kinds of challenges, and they've had to address them and transform in order to survive. 
And so that's a big part of this uh, idea of sustainability is adapting to changing conditions. Sometimes they like to have, uh, a government might like to have uh, irrigation management transfer so that uh, they can slow down the rural to urban uh, um, migration of people. It's something that's continuing to happen now, uh, also in sub-Saharan Africa, as I understand it. Um, but they may want to slow it down and keep more people on the farm and make it profitable and worthwhile for them to stay on the farms. And of course, we like to have um, increased agricultural productivity, as I said, and uh, profitability. So if we want to do a management transfer, when should we do it? Um, and there have been different approaches taken in different projects in different countries over the last few decades. Uh, you could do it at the beginning of the program, uh, or you could do it at the middle sometime, or you could do it at the end of the program. Um, generally speaking, if we do it at the end of the program, it's a mistake because that means that you prepare them and then you, you sign the papers and hand it over and say, now it's yours, goodbye. And this is not so good because you need to keep them on track and they need um, continuing support in order to survive as an organization um, that can be financially self-sustainable and, and, and keep doing uh, its, and keep continuing its operations. If you do it right at the beginning, you can do that too, but the problem is in many cases you need to create these organizations first. And in order to have management transfer to an organization, you need to have that organization legally um, registered in country. And every country has different laws about um, nonprofit organizations and so on and so on. And in some countries, they've actually um, pushed through legislation uh, specifically for water users associations and the rules about how they're created, how they can be dissolved, uh, which we hope wouldn't happen, um, how they need to do elections and various other things in that. Or it may be just, just uh, be according to existing legislation. Um, we don't want to do it in the middle necessarily either because we want them to start taking, get, get the idea in their head that they're going to be taking over uh, uh, administration, management, and operation of these systems um, and uh, get them used to doing that, actually doing that, and then just be by their side and help them along with uh, problems and challenges they face as they go along until the end of the project. So I would say that the best time is somewhere between the middle and the beginning, um, and preferably right after or soon after they get legally registered. Um, I've worked, these are countries uh, in the last about 18 years that I've worked on, um, um, specifically on irrigation management transfer projects and creation of water user associations for uh, World Bank, MCC, um, Inter-American Development Bank and others. Um, and, um, and as I say, I, I was, um, I'm an engineer um, and, and in about 2000 and, um, 2000 and, 2005 actually, I was hired by MCC to go to Armenia as an institutional specialist. So I thought that was very, um, <laughs> even humorous for me as an engineer to be hired as an institutional specialist. But it's because of work that I'd done earlier in South America on management transfer. And uh, two colleagues and I, uh, we wrote a book on irrigation management transfer. And so I guess that may be an expert in it, although I, I really can't claim to be an expert. I just have experience in that. Um, many people have not heard of Moldova. Uh, that's the last one on the list here. Um, so I say it's between Romania and Ukraine. It's a small country, for, former Soviet Republic. Um, the state of Nebraska is about six times larger than the whole country of Moldova. Um, but I was working there actually the last uh, four and a half years until last August, and that was an MCC project that I'll talk about a little bit more here. Um, here's a meeting uh, with uh, one of our, uh, the person standing up there is the, uh, one of the representatives of the local um, irrigation authority or agency uh, talking with the farmers in the Andes Mountains. 
and uh, explaining to them about the transfer and what it means and what they're responsible for. And, and this was after they had been created and a lot of training and capacity building was given to them. Um, and then the end message, of course, is that um, good luck, I hope you're successful. <laughs> And this was fortunately not at the end of the program, not at the end of the project, but we still had two more years to go and we helped the, these associations with more capacity building and training, study tours, um, uh, to help convince them and, and uh, make them confident that they could really do it. And this was one of seven irrigation systems we worked with there. And, uh, and Christopher Neal also worked uh, on that project uh, part-time. We had another project after that in Dominican Republic. We worked with, um, I don't remember how many it was, but it was some 20 uh, irrigation systems around the country. And some of these water users associations had already been created and, and existed under a USAID project in the mid 1980s. We came here in uh, year 2000 to about 2004 and um, we strengthened the existing ones who had a hiatus where they didn't have any support or any appreciable support. And we picked them up and kept them going uh, and strengthened them organizationally and institutionally. And like all of these uh, uh, water users associations, they'll tend to take two steps forward and one step back. And they need someone there who they can trust and rely on to uh, keep them on the right path, and if they go astray, put them back on the road, road again uh, that we think, according to best practices, is the road to success in the long term for these associations. And you can do all kinds of training, you can do all kinds of uh, capacity building, but things will come up, unexpected challenges will come up uh, that you could not have foreseen. Just things that they decide to do suddenly or they don't do, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, you, know, you have to go out there and tell them that's the wrong way. Um, you need to do like this and this is why. Um, uh, all kinds of things come up, all kinds of problems come up. Um, in this project, um, it, was, it, it was actually two concurrent projects by Inter-American Development Bank and World Bank um, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Christopher Neal uh, spent a year there and uh, worked on mapping the irrigation systems and we collaborated in a strategic partnership on um, the water users registries, which is a database of water users, their names, contact information, where their lands are, uh, what their payments have been, and so on, which is a key and really an, an essential piece of these associations because if they don't keep track of who is who and who is paid and who's been, deli been delivered water, they won't be financially sustainable, they won't cover their costs, the maintenance will go down, the operation, uh, the, the water delivery service will go down, and people will, will want to pay even less, and, the whole, and it can spiral down until the association uh, fails. Uh, so we worked on that, and, and we, we combined the um, databases with a, uh, a, ge in a geo reference with using GIS and maps, so you could see where people were uh, and connected data. Well, a GIS, of course, is a database, but we linked the water users registry database with the GIS maps, and it was very good. And we did the same thing in Moldova. <clears throat> okay, so I'm hurrying up here now. Uh, I've got 56 seconds according to the clock here, <laughs> or 56 minutes. Yeah, you're fine. yeah. another hour's fine. Okay. So this is a, uh, most recently, as I said, I worked in Moldova. Um, it was a project on irrigation management transfer and river basin management. Uh, it was under MCC Compact there. The, um, the whole project was, um, on this was uh, over well over $100 million. Um, and it ended in August. This is a, uh, a Water Users Association having their annual General Assembly meeting, doing elections, uh, approving the budget for the next year, uh, discussing, I discussing issues, uh, modifications to the bylaws, and so on. 
Um, in Moldova, we had 11 CIS, that means central irrigation systems that were remnants of the Soviet times, uh, completely, or you could say 98% dilapidated, some not functioning at all, some barely functioning and irrigating a small portion of the area. Um, these MCC went in and rebuilt 10 of these 11 systems um, at a cost of about construction, design and construction cost of about $90 million. And I thought it was really courageous of MCC to do that. No one else had, had the courage, uh, for lack of a better word, um, to do this. Um, World Bank said it's not possible, forget it. Uh, and others said, no, it's a losing proposition. But they actually went in and built infrastructure there, put in new pump stations, new pipes, reservoirs, uh, automation systems, and so on. It was really, uh, really quite an investment. It was only about 15,000 hectares, but again, remember that Moldova, the entire country, is only about one-sixth the size of Nebraska. Um, around 9,500 water users total, um, we spent on the Water Users Associations on, on one of the sub-activities of our project about $500,000 per Water User Association just on um, organizing them, uh, registering them, uh, and doing an incredible amount of capacity building and training to get them up to speed. Um, and this little pie chart just shows uh, 17 at the top there is the number of formal training events in the first year when we were just getting them organized, then 54 in the second year, 90, 179, and 212 in the fifth year of the project. And as Melissa said this morning, all of the uh, MCC compacts are exactly five years. When the five years comes up, it's, it's, it's just cut off and stopped right there. You can keep working, but you won't get paid. So mostly people don't keep working at least contractors. There are a lot of different capacity building topics you need to do. You want to build local capacity, local capability to uh, manage these associations and do it in the right way. And I won't go through all of these things, it's too much. I even have a second slide with more. Um, but we have some of these are classroom, formal classroom training, and other ones are um, held in the field. And all of them are uh, meant to be very, very practical um, and pragmatic so that they can apply these concepts and um, ideas right away and not just think about them. Um, and as some people also said this morning, we, we cover, um, we intersperse in all of the training gender aspects and gender inclusiveness, uh, not just because it's a good thing, but because it will help them uh, when men and women are working together to uh, solve problems and move things ahead. So what do we want to do to make the transfer successful? We'll build the organizations from the bottom up uh, and we'll keep repeating things. We may do training over and over again. Uh, when new people come in, they have some turnover in personnel, new people are elected, and so on. You need to repeat this message or if you see that they're not doing what you told them that they should be doing, then you repeat it again. We make it very participatory so that they have a sense of ownership and that they don't say it's your project, but they say it's our project. And that's very important, again, for the durability of this kind of investment. We want to have transparency, both financial and operational. Financial means that um, anybody can go in and ask uh, what, what was the income last year, what were the expenditures, where did it go, and also to have financial records to permit an annual audit which is not to find out if somebody's stealing money necessarily, but to find out uh, what could be done better and where are the weaknesses in the accounting system. And it's a healthy part of any organization or business. Operational transparency means you have an operations plan and you document how it was implemented. So did you really apply that plan as it was designed or did you deviate from it? And when you do this, you can come up with um, performance indicators. And of course, you have to have a lot of patience. In this Moldovan project, uh, we worked for five years with them, but um, the, the problem is, is that the irrigation system construction, reconstruction, uh, it, it wasn't finished until the final uh, three or four months of the five-year program. So a lot of stuff we told them was hypothetical. 
when the project, when the system is running, you have to do like this. And when this, you have water, you do like this. And so it was unfortunate in terms of the sequencing and the timing. But now uh, USAID is starting a new project. Um, it should be starting this um, early this autumn. Um, that means early this fall. And, um, and it will continue to give some support to those uh, water use associations. Um, Okay, one of the training topics is about the role of the board of directors or the administrative council, what they should do, because they don't know what to do. They get elected and they really don't know what to do. And I've already talked about transparency, financial and operational. It's critical, otherwise the water users are suspicious of what's happening and they don't know um, why someone's getting the water now, they don't know where their money went and they're naturally going to be suspicious. And, and some cultures may be more suspicious than others. Um, here are some examples. The operations plans can be really simple. Uh, this one on the left is uh, in Dominican Republic. It's just showing a well and a list of water users and how many minutes they get the water each until it rotates back to the top again. So very simple, but at least it's formalized and people know how much, uh, who gets the water in what order and how much time. The one on the, on the right hand side is from Thailand. It's at the head of a lateral canal. It's showing the days that water should be flowing in that canal and the flow rate. So people know that it's, um, it's being operated the way that it's, was, um, said, it was said to be operated or was planned to be operated. Here's a guy in Armenia with, again, a list of water users and how many minutes they get the water. Uh, very simple, just written by hand. Uh, these operations plans can be much more sophisticated, of course, um, involving uh, remote sensing, involving uh, remote data acquisition, and so on. But this O&M planning is critical because it go, feeds into the annual budget development. And without the, the good, solid budget development, you can't have a good financial plan, and you, you, uh, you can only hope that you will recover your cost uh, during the year to uh, continue operation, maintenance, and administration. Um, it's, good to have, um, it's good to have an annual conference. It's good to have a federation, uh, maybe a national or regional federation of water user associations so that um, they can exchange ideas and have some economy of scale for certain services uh, that are not feasible at the individual water use association level. So um, talking about all this, there are a number of thing, good things that can happen from this management transfer. And here I'm showing um, a list of bullets. So I won't talk about these because they told me my time's up. Um, but I want to end here um, by asking the question, does it always work? because if you know about irrigation management transfer, there have been many cases where it's failed. And in every country that I've seen, that I've worked in on this, or in every country that I've, um, uh, that I've heard about or read about, there have been successes and failures. And for various reasons, and this is another, a whole other thing to talk about, um, some of them thrive and do okay, some of them limp along, some of them fail. Um, it depends on a lot of factors like I'm showing here. Um, so sometimes there are, is a wrench in the gears, sometimes there are many wrenches in the gears, and it, it hurts the uh, organization. And finally, this is not only about small, uh, small holders, it's also large holders uh, that are sometimes the beneficiaries of this uh, management transfer. So yeah, there's my email address. If you like, you can send me an email and tell me what you think, and I'd be happy to answer questions too. So thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. I, I want to start uh, expressing my gratitude to the Institute for the invitation to come here. It is a, 
a big honor for me to be in this conference. And also it's a really a very good feeling to be back in Lincoln after 16 years and see my former professors around there, uh, here in Eisenhower and Terrence Martin over there. So I, I will talk a, uh, about uh, water uses organization and our experience on that. So in that sense, it was very good, the, the chain of the order, because the previous presentation of uh, Gary explained a lot about how water user organization works. So I will uh, use, because I, I must say that I was really nervous because all the talking was about Africa and I was to, going to talk about Chile, so. But it's good, because now I am going to talk about the importance of water user organization in Chile condition. So let's see if this works. Is the green bottle? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that is a map. I, I really like that map over there. We show the condition of Chile. We, we have a very long country, about four, more than 4,000 kilometers long, so we go from the most arid desert in the world. Iquique is a city that has about an average of one millimeter per year of rain to the most, a very wet south part of the country. But for the agricultural point of view, what we really, uh, the agriculture is developed in the semi-arid area of Chile, and uh, which is located in the central part, just between the orange and the green part in the map. So uh, I saw in the morning a picture that say that in Chile we have uh, plenty of water. That might be the average condition. So the average condition is in the middle. So we have floods. And that is the lower picture shows the reality that we need to face when we have the irrigation season. So uh, because our Mediterranean climate, most of the rain is concentrated in the winter and the agriculture uh, need irrigation in summer, so we need to storage and have water in that time. And that means a lot of administration and water management. And most of the people, and that is quite logical, concentrate in the cities that are in the agricultural area. So we have in the central part of Chile, the most important city, about 70% of the Chilean population live in the agricultural area, where there is a lot of pressure of water scarcity and flood vulnerability. Just two weeks ago, we have a flood in Santiago. It was a stupid flood, but was a $50 million damage flood. So um, it is very interesting for us that our water organization system, our water user organization, came from a Spanish rule. And that came from Arabic uh, tradition. So that is the reason that you will find a lot of similarity between the water user organization in New Mexico, over there, that the one that are located in Chile. And that is because the Spanish transfer the uh, organization to the colonial time in our country. Some countries like Mexico, they make a revolution, they change a lot, but other country, and New Mexico State, for example, they keep the, the, the Spanish tradition, and that is the base of what the manager insists in Chile. So for 400 years of our history, we have been based on a water manager doing by the water user. And only in a 14 year, we have a revolution. In the year 1967, we start with the land reform and then we have one different law that give more power to the state. But that lasts only a few years because we have the military crash in the 73, and then we have the new law in the 81. So 
only in 400 years of history, we have only 14 years, less than that, when the state has a relevant paper role in the water managers in Chile. So the land reform that started in the late 60s make a deep change in the agricultural, uh, Chilean agriculture, but I, maybe what, some of you has the chance to read Isabel Allende and the House of the Spirit. She described very well what happened. We have this um, land reform, and some of, just like Gary mentioned, it was very theoretical. So they give parcel to the farmer, but they didn't make technical transfer. So the farmer did not have idea how to work with the farm, and they get in poverty, they get more poor. And that what happened, some made to the city to work, and the old people stay in the farm. And in the 81 came the new water law that is currently the law we have, and we are having big, big discussion to change that, and we are still discussing after many years. But the important point of that water law regarding the water right is that are given by the state to the user, water rights are treated as a commodity, are separate with the land, so there is no relation between land use and water rights, and also by law, water administration is done by water user organization. So, sorry. And then water user organization, as I told you, come for the tradition from the Arabic, and later for the Spanish rule. So it's a very centenarian tradition. But, but, after the year 95, there was a big conference in Dublin, everyone make a citation of that conference. I was not there, I was here in Nebraska in that time. But uh, after the year 2000, we start realizing in Chile that we might have a very nice uh, state uh, government project funded by very clever engineers, but they're not going to have any result if the state does not enforce, improve, the water user organization. So we started about 15 years ago working on the improvement of the water user organization. And we, I, I must say probably that we, in our department, water resources department, we were one of the group that started with this process. And we have been working for more than 15 years on that. And a very important issue of that is the professionalization of the administration. So we have about 3,000 water user organizations in Chile, and about 100 of them are really good. And they have agricultural engineers, civil engineers, agronomists, that are the ones who administrate the water user organization, and they are very successful. So that is the future in Chile. Also, I had this uh, slide yesterday, like last night. We also start the Rural Drinking Water Cooperative because drinking water is separate legally for irrigation water, but they are relative because these are user water user organization, one for irrigation and the other one for drinking water, that are in Chile rural areas. And they are farmer or rural people organization that are really important. Then come the irrigation law in the 85 that has a deep impact on agriculture and it produces a large chain of production pattern we learn that we may irrigate and we have a very profitable crops that transform agriculture in a business. But we get an agriculture more, more vulnerable to water scarcity. And my country is directly impacted by a Nino condition, Enzo, 
and the Pacific decadal oscillation. So we have time with a lot of water, and we are now in a 10 year, the last wet year in Chile was 2006. And since that, we are having that year. We are not sure what is going on this year, but we complete 10 years of water scarcity. And one point that is relevant is that the water rate were distributed during the wet years in the 80s with a lot of water. So the system worked very well in wet condition, but now that we have water scarcity, the system are really, we are having problem. So, I mentioned to you the water law. When we come back to the, the democracy in the year 91, the president of that time, that just passed away last week, and we make a big funeral in Chile, he focused to improve the smallholder agriculture, just to give the support to, to improve the quality of life because we have all the population, migration of young people, or all this problem. So we have a lot of uh, non-governmental organization that I, I also was working on. The, we were working on that, but didn't work very well because the lack of uh, organization that can take the small farmer, the small holder, and be a leader of them. All this situation and the chain of the agricultural pattern, as I told you before, create an agriculture that is more vulnerable. So we have more production, but we are more vulnerable. And then we have more dependency of groundwater. So groundwater is more developed in Chile in the last 15 years. And also, agriculture must face another problem, the land use competition. We, I mentioned to you, we have a small holders that get old, and they have the children, and the farm is close to the city, so they parcel the land again, and they sell the land to make a beautiful house near the city, and a lot of cities, most of the Chilean cities, have been growing a lot for the suburbia, and people have a house in the, near the city and, well, less available land for farmers. Another issue that is very important for the Chilean farmer is that we develop agriculture oriented to the exportation of fruits, products, to the United States, to Europe, to China, but there is a lot more restriction and more uh, demand of the market for food safety and more environmental restrictions. So we have a competition for the use of the land, more rest, um, demand for better quality, and water scarcity. So it's quite hard the life of the farmer. And more of them, we have a change in the society. The Chilean society changed a lot in the last 20 years, and now we have another stakeholder people who buy a kayak and they like to use a kayak in the river and they don't like that the farmer take the water for irrigation, ecosystem protection, cultural value, the Indian Mabusha are reclaiming for the lands in the south. Another uh, Aymara people in the north, uh, a lot of problems that are pressure the, the, the system. We have sort shortage of water in the rural area, because we have the water scarcity, and conflict, because, for example, this is a, a icon of a conflict, the Laja waterfall, which if you make a survey for many Chilean, and you ask a, a picture as icon of Chile, probably one of the main icon is the Laja waterfall, and it's become dry, because the water is taken for irrigation, so it is a problem. And there is a lot of conflict, social conflict. And that is a new situation for, for farmers. 
And for the, that is a new uh, slate related to the small form holder. Because the new condition, the new aspiration of Chilean society, some of the small holder say, okay, I am not going to do farming, I am going to do rural tourists, or I am going to go to uh, gourmet food production. So this is a new um, idea that have been taking place in my country in the last 10 years. So what happened here is that we have all this rural population, and we need to go with them to do technical transfer, but that haven't worked very well. But that is the place when the water use organization are taking his, their role. So in many places in Chile, we have a very successful water use organization, not everyone. We have a very, very bad one, but I, I would like to keep the good one, as the Longaví, the Digijin, which are river near my city, where they do the support to the small holder, to the farmer, even to the large farmer. They get the information, they coordinate the technical transfer, support of project. Uh, also, they are doing support for the drinking water, the rural drinking water company, and even are facing conflict between rural and urban area. For example, the, uh, we have some people that think about the urban area and they say, what we are going to do with the storm water? I will take that to the irrigation channel. So it's a big mix that we have in some city. So all of this is done by the water user organization. They are playing a new role in society. We, they, they did have this centenarian role on water allocation, but now they are part of the society. They are uh, working with the smallholder. They are facing problems, so they are changing the logs. And as I told you before, we are having a big discussion about a water manager in Chile. We do not have watershed organization because the law of the 91 didn't consider that. So we have very conservative people, people who want to change everything, and we have a big discussion. But there is one aspect that we agree, and there is a consensus. Water user organization must play a very important role in the future of water administration in Chile. So you might see that even people who, that don't agree in different aspects, we agree in the importance of the water user organization. So they are going to have every time more important role that are different for the traditional role. And we are working on the uh, on the improvement on that. They need to include different actors like irrigation. For example, there is one successful one in Cachaboal, near Rancagua, that incorporates hydroelectricity, mining, and drinking water company. They are very important on rural water organization, and now uh, the law allow us to have this uh, groundwater user organization that the only way that can work is if they are related to the traditional water user organization. So also they are going to go to the groundwater manager. So trying to establish an nexus about Africa. I was thinking, uh, I have no idea about Africa. I never have been there, to be honest. But telling what you are discussing about that, my, my feeling is that which organization are working in Africa? I don't know if they have water user organization, maybe they have tri tri tribes, I don't know, tribus, I don't know how to say that in English, but anyway, maybe they must have some valid, validated by the people organization. So we need to work with them. And I mean, uh, that is our experience. We have a lot of improvement, a lot of improvement, a different chain in the last 20 years because we start improving that. So I believe that that might be a contribution for the Africa topic that we have been discussing is, okay, which organization are relevant for these people and how we can work with them? Okay, well, thank you. Okay, I will take my...
can go live now. OK, thank you for the speakers for their presentation. Now the floor is open for questions. There's a couple of mic there's a microphone here, and there's a couple of loose ones. So um, if you don't mind uh, directing yourself to the microphone for your question. Yeah, so um, my question is to the um, researchers working on in Africa. And as we seek to develop um, smallholder irrigation systems in Africa, um, I want to find out for those that are already working on the ground whether you've encountered issues of lantana. Um, it's a very big issue, especially in West Africa, where um, ownership of land is by families, by clans, by tribes, and and sometimes if you are looking at a bigger irrigation project, say for a community, and you are citing the project. In a, in a place that belongs to, you know, a particular family clan, sometimes um, you have conflicts over the use of the, the facilities. And I'm from Ghana, and we had a scenario where a dam was constructed in a particular community for irrigation purposes. But at the end of the day, um, there was really conflict because um, the project was on someone's land and a family's land, and they were, you know, restricting others from, you know, using the facility. And they, there was a huge problem surrounding the whole project, and it was not really very successful. I don't know what has happened now, but that was really a big challenge. So I don't know, as we are looking at it, um, whether you've encountered such issues and whether you are looking at that, addressing those land issues, property rights issue as well. Thank you. So uh, maybe we can adjust that question on land tenure to the smallholder context of Africa. Stu or, or Tim, would you like to uh, take, take a... Sure. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. And, um, we, we do work in Ghana uh, as well as Burkina Faso. Uh, so have some experience in West Africa. I, I will say though that um, our work there has been focused on the application of small-scale household technologies, um, generally to existing water sources. So <clears throat> our experience has not uh, included sort of the communal development of water sources. Um, so in many ways, it's kind of tapping into some existing resources that are there, uh, but with some improved technologies like the application of, of drip and, and improved pumping. Uh, most of that is coming off um, individual wells uh, drawing from groundwater sources. Um, in Burkina, there is the system of uh, maraichage, uh, where you have some of the areas of, um, with the reservoirs and, and some farmer associations already in place. Um, I, I think where, where we've been more conscious, I guess, of the issues is that, uh, you know, as you know, a lot of the farms then are not one continuous uh, piece of land, but, but somewhat scattered. And being conscious even of the dynamics within the household. Um, so from a gender perspective, um, you know, who is actually controlling the technology? Uh, where is that well located? Often the man and the woman will have separate plots that they are, that they are cultivating. Um, so we, we've looked at it actually at a very, very micro level in the sense of the intra-household dynamics, um, but haven't really had experience, I would say, in terms of the communal development of those water sources. I, I noted, Gary, that uh, you had some experience with Burkina Faso Water Users Associations that might be... Mm -hmm. Well, we in Burkina Faso, we only sent a, a team there once, and it was for MCC for evaluation of a, um, actually evaluation of the implementation of a compact that was already underway. Um, um, so does that, yeah, does that satisfactorily not yeah. answer your question? I, I would chip in that, I mean, the research is really clear, that if land tenure rights were clear, in, in, in many countries, not only African countries, but many other countries as well, then you immediately gain access to credit. You can use titles uh, against, not only for agriculture, but for, for anything. And secondly, 
you know, sometimes I go to these conferences and people say, why are you messing around with smallholders? Because you get to these big plots and that's when you get productivity really raised because you get economies of scale, you can mechanize. And um, the reality is, is that the African context, in most African countries, that's not going to change anytime soon. That land is hereditary, it's brought down from generation to generation, there's no cadastral system, there's no legal system in place, and that's, that's I don't think that'll change in my lifetime, frankly. So I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that we need to work on the smallholder aspect with or without land rights, unfortunately. Um, I, I have a member from a situation in the dry areas near my home city, my, the, my city, when there, is a, there was a big project financed by the Japanese government. So they established to make some small reservoir, and everything was fine to do the reservoir, but the two persons who owned the land where the reservoir was going to be done, they were angry which one to the other. So they say, we don't want reservoir because it's going to be good for that person. So after that, they go to the school, the rural school, and they used again to identify what person are more easily combines to, to do this project, and then they start with this people. So there is not water user organization, but there is another people who can help to go to the territory. I, I could also speak to just one other non-African example um, where we have been involved more in communal uh, water source development, which is the, the multiple use systems that I spoke to in Nepal. Um, and I think there, there's that very same issue of often you have people who are close. This is in the highland areas where you've got gravity-fed uh, you know, water systems, and those who are closer to the source then obviously have first dibs on whatever's coming out. You also have the additional dynamic that uh, Dalits, the sort of so-called untouchable caste, are not actually allowed within the community to go to the water source. They're seen to be contaminating it. And so actually the introduction of some of these piped systems has helped to ameliorate some of that in that they're then getting the water piped directly to their home and they don't have to then worry about getting somebody else to go and get the water for them, which is what they had to do previously uh, because they weren't permitted uh, by the local custom to do that. Um, I'm gonna follow up with a question to uh, Jose Luis on you made a comment on um, uh, how everyone agrees that water users associations are important to, to move forward in, in resolving these conflicts. Does the Chilean public uh, in general understand the impacts that, uh, that climate change potentially will have on, on the snow fall in the Andes and, and how much water will be available and the need for more infrastructure? Is that something that, that's in, the, in yes. the, the radar screen of the... Uh, that is a, a driving force now. People are very scared of climate change. And that helped us to start the discussion about the water law reform. Because farmer, the most conservative area of Chile are very scared of climate change. They don't know what is going to happen. So they accept that we need to discuss. So in that sense, climate change had been... A, I don't know how to say that, but a good thing because allow the discussion. Okay, uh, uh, Gary, you you mentioned you made a comment at the end of your presentation that uh, that management transfer doesn't always work. So, what are the conditions that uh, lead for an unsuccessful uh, management transfer of a system? Um, well, I listed uh, several bullets on that last slide that I just went through them quickly. I didn't talk about them, but sometimes, the, as I said, the uh, regional agencies who are uh, cur currently or were previously responsible for um, operating these systems, they will try to take them back after the project finishes. Or sometimes larger landowners will um, they'll take control of the Water Users Association and because they're the ones who are able to pay right now uh, and they have more understanding about business and being an entrepreneur um, and it will be to the disadvantage of the smaller farmers. Um, in other cases, it's because 
the irrigation management transfer occurred uh, without any kind of support. They just uh, went, uh, had a, the newspaper reporters there and everyone, and they said, okay, sign here, now it's yours. And, and without any kind of support. Whereas in most of the projects that I worked on, we had uh, three different aspects to the management transfer. And one was agricultural development, so helping the farmers move to higher value crops and crop diversification so that they could afford to pay for the full cost of the uh, water delivery services, including the maintenance of the system and administration. Another one was irrigation system rehabilitation and or improvement. So improvement means not just uh, re rebuilding part of the system, but extending it out or putting different features in that would make the water management and the operation uh, better. And then, of course, the third one is the organizational development and institutional strengthening uh, component of it. And as I said, these things usually in international development, uh, people have, uh, donor agencies tend to have a short-term um, short view, uh, for example, five years, and it's because they get funding from Congress or, or whoever is funding it. And, um, and agricultural development and changing the way people think and do things, behavioral change, it doesn't just happen overnight. And as someone else was also mentioning this morning, um, the farmers, they want to see that something's working before they take a risk and, and uh, adopt that or try it. They, they want to see it's working and that someone has been successful with it because they already face so many other risks. They, don't, they can't control the weather. Often they can't control the cost of the inputs, fertilizer, machinery, and so on. And they can't control the price of the products they sell. Uh, so they're kind of at the mercy of a lot of things, and they tend to be risk adverse, and try to um, and try to go only with things that are that are uh, for sure. And it's the same thing here in the United States, firms. And there can be political reasons too, where they change things or make decisions without consulting anyone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if if. Anyone has questions? Please direct yourself to the microphone, and uh, then I'll uh, I'll uh, allow you to <laughs> or ask you to ask the question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I'm from Indonesia, so most farmer in my country is subsistence farmer, and they have small acres around like one to three hectares only. So. Sometimes like our difficulty when we try to introduce new technology to them, they are not financially feasible because they are like have to small acreage. So I'm just like wondering even like if we open the credit access to them, is it any what they call guarantee that it will be sustainable in the future? Or do you have any suggestion what we should do with this kind of like smallholder farmer who only have like small, even they have small and they are, I mean, their farm is very dispersed all over. It's not in one place. So I think that's kind of difficulty that we have. Thank you. Yeah, great question. I think the um, most solutions to poverty usually start with the question of how do you insert credit into into markets and ag technology is, is no different. It's very hard to do, in part because the banks themselves are, are very risk averse when it comes to uh, agriculture, or more specifically, they, they find it much easier to lend out on, on the trading markets and very simple vendors and, uh, and other sources. And the timing required by agriculture, because you have to get the loan in at a certain time, get the payout at a certain time, you know, most, most, don't, most banks find easier routes to profitability than ag markets. The third part is, is rule. Well, the, the distance is changing because you can now make payments by cell phone, so it's getting a lot better. And we found with other technologies in randomized control trial that if microfinance is introduced, the consumer is four more times likely to buy the product than if uh, microfinance is not available at the point of purchase. So right now we're exploring 
injecting microfinance all across our organization, and we have several partnerships with groups like Kiva and Opportunity International and others that are, are willing to, to go down those paths with us. Um, but I, th I think the, um, the, the kind of larger question on costs and price sensitivity of the very poor, I think that is actually a more interesting question, which you alluded to. And you know, when you, when you are living on a dollar a day and you look at prices, it's much different than how, how anyone in this room, I guess, would consider a price. You would buy something at a more expensive amount you know, that might deliver value for you at that higher rate. Whereas, or uh, some of the rural poor consider investments as a bank. So you, they buy something knowing that they can resell it. So that product actually serves as a very poor bank, which is losing value and depreciating as time goes on. And I think that question is something we've pushed down on and we've gotten some really uh, interesting responses and that's how the poor view spending money. Yeah, many, um Many uh, donors and financiers of these kind of things, they've, they're very interested these days in microfinancing and revolving funds and so on. Um, and sometimes these are put through local banks. Uh, so the, the bank is not taking the risk. The bank is actually gaining from some percentage on these. Um, the risk is with the donor agency to provide these funds. And then it's stipulated that these funds, once they start coming back in, the payments made on the loans, that uh, the, the money will revolve back and it will be available for more loans in the future. Um, one of the problems with this is that a lot of the smaller, and even in some cases most of the smaller farmers, they, they are not gonna go fill out a form, even a one-page form. Uh, they're not gonna go walk into the bank. They don't trust the bank and so on. They don't have any experience. They feel intimidated by the whole thing. And even for maybe for us, it would seem very simple and easy to fill out a form and, and submit it for a loan. Uh, they're totally intimidated by it. Uh, and they'll go more for loans um, within their communities, um, informal types of loans. And I think in many countries, I've seen this, this kind of behavior. So when you set up these uh, loan things and um, small grants, uh, microfinancing and so on, it will be the medium and larger um, people who have the confidence and are willing to go ahead and, and apply for them. Yeah. I mean, so much depends on the local situation, obviously, but I, I want to come back also to the output market and, you know, where in the first instance are the opportunities. Um, and then I think it's about sort of pointing things toward that. Um, also recognizing what's driving farmer behavior. I think there was already a point made by one of you about the risk aversion. Um, you know, I think profitability is one thing, but also the risk and volatility is another. Uh, and so how do you deal with that? Uh, and I think if you have, you know, the, the output market in view, you can make that path a little bit clearer um, by putting together, you know, packages that um, make it easier for the farmer to see the path between where they are now and that market, um, which includes, you know, the right seed and advice and, and technology that fits together. But I don't think there's any way around demonstrating the possible. Uh, and that will be early adopters, people who have a little bit more leeway for taking risk. They may not be your smallest or uh, you know, lowest income farmers. Um, generally, they won't be. Uh, but I think that's, we, we tend to see that as part of just the natural adoption curve. Um, it's those slightly higher up people first who kind of come in and are able to take those risks. Then others start crowding in and as and when they see that it's, it's succeeding. Uh, Stu, I have a, a question uh, re regarding your presentation. You talked about Drip Plus. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear uh, uh, a lot of stories about sometimes uh, how drip irrigation fails uh, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, uh, water quality being one of them. And uh, could you comment on, on th this uh, failures or successes mm -hmm. and what, what are the typical problems you've run into yep. as you try to introduce this technology to smallholder farmers? Well, full disclosure, we have failures. <laughs> um, and I would say when it comes to drip particularly, yes, there are certain hardware failures at points. I mean, you just have issues with quality and sometimes issues with clogging, you're not dealing with, you know, drinking water quality going through the system. Um, 
But for me, I think the biggest failures have come from the software side. And that's why we're emphasizing on the plus piece. You, you can have the right technology, but without the supports around it, without it fitting within that production system properly, it's going to fail. Um, and one of, the, one of the challenges that we find working with, um, you know, pushing this through businesses, pushing this through a market, is that you do have government programs or other subsidy programs out there at the same time that are looking to push large amounts of product through a pipeline and then just give it away. And for the businesses you're working with, it's a great opportunity financially to make a bulk sale uh, you know, into a larger program versus going out and dealing with all these individual scattered customers. But the end result can often be then, you, know, you go out and those systems are just lying unused or they were used for half the season and they gave up because they didn't have the technical support. They conclude it doesn't work. And those situations we find we're actually starting not from zero but from minus 10 because you're going into situations where people have then developed a negative connotation versus just not knowing it, they've actually developed a negative connotation around the product. It doesn't work, um, it's too difficult, it's too expensive, all of those things. Um, or people are then just waiting to receive another one for, for free rather than uh, being willing to invest in the, in the product. But it, so I, I really think it's, it's, it's a lot of those, um, those software issues around it, um, even though we do see like I say, failures with the, the product itself. It's, it's usually more a failure of the, the, the system or the business model around it. Any other questions from the floor? It's related to what you're just talking about, but because um, you're talking about how it's not necessarily technical problems that are hardest, it's the people problems more or less. Can so you step how, towards the microphone? Oh, so how, I guess my question is, how do you navigate the cultural differences in all the different countries you work in uh, to ensure that these projects are going to be successful? Like, how do you keep a pulse on what's needed? Like, what, what strategy do you have for that? Well, speaking for, for IDE, I mean, the short answer is how do we navigate the cultural differences? I mean, we have 1,000 employees worldwide and, and, you know, we have 26 people on a clipboard in the United States. I mean, we're not, we're, we're based uh, overseas. So our, our human-centered design process, which goes through the steps, uh, of identifying and cultivating the information that you need to design and then later sell a product, which we go through a, a different process for sales as well. Those are, are deeply rooted in, in, in the culture. There are some similarities, but you, you know, the, and the sales process itself, I mean, Americans sell to other Americans and, and, and Zimbabweans sell to other Zimbabweans. That's, those are the most effective sales techniques and understanding the nuances of the transaction is very important in both cultures. So I, I think you've, you ask a really good question. As an international nonprofit and that owns and operates businesses, we, we tend to think uh, that whoever's closest to the transaction knows the most about what makes it tick. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's important that you, uh, get, you identify and work with local partners. Um, it could be NGOs, it could be uh, local firms who know the people, know the language, know the culture, and can help you do things in an appropriate way and avoid pitfalls. Um, and um, and I think in the materials also, the materials you use, you may take them from country A and use them in country B, but you need to adapt them to be culturally sensitive or appropriate. Otherwise, some things they don't make sense or they look wrong or even could be offensive. Yeah. So we're down to the last couple of minutes. Uh, any uh, final thoughts or questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Any final uh, thoughts from any of the panelists? I would just like everybody here to please help me cultivate the lie that this was a packed house today. <laughs> Can we all agree to that? <laughs> well, uh, we, there was two concurrent, uh, th there were three concurrent <laughs> sessions, so the, there was a division of the uh, ranks of the, of the conference, so that's of one course. of the reasons. Yeah, and the, the other two sessions had donuts, right? Oh, <laughs> donuts, we should have had donuts, thank you. <laughs> Any uh, other final comments? Next from time, muffins and donuts <laughs> for everyone. Well, thank you very much for everyone for attending. And uh, 
thanks for coming and uh, thanks for the panelists for their presentations and, and insightful comments. Uh, now we'll... Yeah.